Cool, thanks. I was uh, coming through security today. I always get nervous when I go through the security because I have a little bit of a record. Um, <laughs> some of you know that, you know, we've, as we got to know people that were struggling, a part of loving our neighbor meant challenging the policies that are crushing their lives, right? And uh, so when we were 20 years ago, we were challenging the anti-homeless laws that passed in our city with, that made it illegal to share food. You literally couldn't take a pizza into the park and share it. Uh, it was illegal. And so we challenged all those laws. Thank thankfully, we won in co court, but I um, still have a little bit of a record, right? So when I was coming over the border, this is one of my favorite times. So this wasn't today, but it was recently because I called Nate and gave him a heads up. I'm like, listen, when I get really nervous, I just tell him to call you and just say that we're friends and we're coming to hang out. So anyway, but I was going through Canada security one time and they, they asked the, the inevitable question, right? Um, have you ever been arrested? And I'm like, <clears throat> yes, but for good stuff, right? And the guy goes, like, what good stuff? I said, well, challenging these anti-homeless laws. And he's like, have you ever been arrested for anything else? I'm like, yeah, for vigiling against the death penalty. And then he said, anything else? I'm like, yeah, trying to get rid of assault weapons in our country. He goes, anything else? I mean, I was like, I just want to be honest with you. I also got arrested for a peaceful protest against the Iraq war. He's like, you're arrested for that? And I said, yeah. And he goes, well, welcome to Canada. <laughs> so... Um, it's nice to be here, and you know, I know that you all have your problems too, but just, um, I might have to move up sometime too, just in case things get too crazy, but you know, I, we've been trying to figure this thing out, just like you all, what it looks like to really take the words of Jesus seriously, to love our neighbor, and I fell in love with Jesus in the Bible Belt and my church, and, and, and then I also began to see some of the contradictions in the church, you know. Uh, I remember hearing a story growing up uh, about a guy living on the streets that uh, he came into a church service on Sunday morning. He wanted to worship Jesus, so he came in, but he, he chose kind of the the fancy church, you know, uh, the big church downtown, and he sat up front. He was excited to go to worship, and sadly, everyone kind of looked at him like he didn't belong, and uh, uh, the the pastor actually came up to the guy. You know, he had his bags with him. He had layers of clothes on because he was living on the streets. And the, and the pastor said, listen, sir, this is the house of God. So I want you to do something. I want you to ask God what you should wear when you come to church. And so, you know, the next week passed and the, and the guy wanted to worship. So he came again, but he came, you know, just the same as he had with all of his bags, wearing his clothes. And he sat down and the pastor recognized him before the service and said, sir, I, I recognize you. You were here last week and I asked you to, to do something. Did you do it? And the guy said, yeah, I asked God what I should wear. And God said he didn't know because he's never been to your church. I know that's a little sassy, but I kind of like that one because I, I think that we know, you know, even as we celebrate the beauty of Southridge and all the incredible relationships that you're forging, I think we know deep down that often the church has been really good at excluding the very people that were magnetized to Jesus. And so it's exciting for me to be in a space that's trying to build those friendships. I mean, I think one of the most radical things Jesus did was just eat with all the wrong people. You know, he, I mean, we think all these tables. Uh, dinner with Jesus, I would think, was a little bit awkward. You know, sometimes when he's got like a zealot. A zealot was a, a revolutionary, right, ready to ro overthrow Rome and sitting next to a Roman tax collector who <laughs> was the man, you know, like, and uh, as my friend Greg Boyd says, zealots killed tax collectors for fun on weekends, right? And yet this is the dinner table that, that Jesus was forming, a marginalized woman next to uh, a, a teacher of the law that would never even get close to one another. So I think what we've got to be doing is finding finding excuses to hang out, right? Whether it's euchre or coming together tonight and, and thinking, how can we make space for these subversive friendships? That's what we call ourselves in our community, that we're forming a web of subversive friends that love each other across all the barriers. And, and there's a story that Jesus told that 
I wanted to invite us to visit tonight because I, you know, I like the Bible and I, some of these stories get pretty wild though, you know, and you may have heard this one before, but um, <laughs> this, this is one of the places where Jesus talks about hell. I promise it won't get too weird up here, but you know, like there's a few, very few places that Jesus actually talks about hell. As much as a lot of Christians love talking about hell, Jesus talked a whole lot more about love. But in this one, he does talk about hell, and it's an interesting story. It's one of those stories that makes you a little uncomfortable, but I want to read it to us. Uh, you know, it's often called the rich man and Lazarus, and it goes like this. There was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen, and he lived in luxury every day. But at his gate was laid a beggar named Lazarus, covered with sores and longing to eat what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs came and they licked the man's sores. Well, the time came when the beggar died and the angels carried him next to Abraham's side. Well, the rich man also died and he was buried. And then in hell, where he was in torment. He looked up and saw Abraham far away with the beggar Lazarus by his side. So he called up to him, Father Abraham, have pity on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue because I'm in agony in this fire. But Abraham replied, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received good things while Lazarus received bad things. And now he is comforted and you are in agony. And besides all this, between us and you, there is a great chasm, a great wall that has been fixed so that no one can cross over from here to you or from there to us. I know it's heavy, right? It's, it's like that old saying, when, when you, you know you've heard the truth, when it comforts the disturbed and disturbs the comfortable. And this is one of those texts, right, where you, you look at this story and the early Christians, they loved this text. I've got a whole book of sermons preached on this story from the early Christians. It's powerful. And one of the things that they point out, is that we need to notice the names. There's something happening that Jesus does with the names. And the rich man doesn't have a name. He could be any one of us. And they pointed out that we know the names of rich folks. We've got stadiums named after them and uh, boulevards and statues named after the rich folks and corporations, right, that are named after them. Uh, but in this story... The rich man doesn't have a name, but the poor man does. And Lazarus means the one God heard and rescued. It, 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 he's the only person that, that has a name in all of the parables of Jesus. And his name is Lazarus. It, it, it's kind of that reminder that, that while we may not know the names of all the folks that are begging or cold out on the street, Jesus does. And those names matter to God, the, the names that we've forgotten. So there's the name thing going, which is interesting. And then the early Christians, they point out that uh, there's also this religion thing, that it's, we don't know much about the poor man Lazarus and his faith and religion, but we know that the rich man was religious because he calls Abraham father. He knows the prophets. He knows the story. And yet his religion did nothing to move him in compassion for the person right on the other side of the wall, right? So the, the, you can be religious and still not have that love and compassion in our soul. What's also interesting is uh, that as you look at the story, the rich man lived in a gated neighborhood, right? He had built a wall that he thought would keep him safe, but it actually was him locking himself in to hell, to the, the, the wall that he built between himself and the, the suffering of the poor man Lazarus became a wall between himself and God. Somebody say amen. I mean, C.S. Lewis said, yeah, I think he was right. He says that hell is often locked from the inside. We lock ourselves in. And that wall wasn't good for the poor man, but it wasn't good for the rich man either. And I, that's why I love the gospel, because it is showing us all 
the way to life and to liberation and to get ourselves out of the, the walls that we hide behind. Mother Teresa used to say, the more stuff we have, the more we have to hide behind. And the invitation of Jesus to live like the lilies and the sparrows is to live a life where we're free, right? We're, we're free to share the gifts of God. We live without fear because what, what, what's the worst that can happen? Were they going to kill us? Well, we'll rise again, right? We're not scared of anything. And yet our culture is conditioning us to fear. So it's, it's communities like this, right, where we encourage each other. We, we invite each other to live beyond our our comfort zone. And please, all of us are most comfortable around the people who are like us, right? No matter who we are, we're most comfortable around the people who are like us, the homogenous rule, right? Whoever talks like me, thinks like me, like it's easy to be around. And so Jesus is stretching us beyond that. I love uh, this one pastor I was just with. He's uh, a mega church pastor in the U.S. I was preaching there on Sunday, and he said, let me tell you, the easiest thing in the world is to build a church where everybody thinks like you, eats like you, and votes like you. But we're trying to do something different. We're trying to build a community that uh, mirrors the diversity of the kingdom of God. And, and that's why in our community, sometimes we say, if it's all white, Something's not quite right, right? We got to get bigger than uh, the people who look like us and think like us. Martin Luther King grieved that one of the most segregated hours in the world is 11 o'clock on Sunday morning. When the church gathers for worship, we often end up mirroring the patterns of the world, right? Of sameness rather than pioneering the beautiful courage that stretches us beyond our comfort. And so I've been, we've been trying to stretch, and it is stretching. It's, it's working new muscles. I, I can remember one of the first times my grandmother came to Philly. She saw the Catholic school at now, and she was like, she saw the little Catholic school girls. She goes, is that a gang? We're like, no, Mama, those are Catholic school girls. It's, it's going to be all right, right? But we're, and we, you know, we're all like uncomfortable at times when we see folks that are different. So I, I'm convinced that this invitation of the rich man and Lazarus is about having new eyes, right? That, that being a Christian is not just about having new ideas, but having new eyes. That we can see the, the image of God in every person. And especially those who this world has tried to crush the image of God in them. As Mother Teresa said, when I hang out with the poor, I see Jesus in his most distressing disguises. We see Jesus every day as we look into the eyes of, of, of one another. Uh, as Dorothy Day of the Catholic Worker Movement once said, the only true atheist is the one who cannot see the image of God in another person because we are the carriers of, of God's divine image in the world. And, and so I, I, I carry these things in my Bible that remind me of the people who have shaped my theology. And one of those was a young woman. One of the first encounters I had when we moved into the north side of Philly uh, was the 25th year of our community in North Philadelphia. And, and we live in a neighborhood where there is so much beauty and there's so much hope, but there's also a lot of struggle. Um, and and we're, we have a lot of the, the drugs and gun uh, violence is concentrated in our neighborhood. A lot of the people that are victims of sex trafficking are, are in uh, on the boulevard and so we're, we're walking one day to the store to get food because we share a lot of food. We have a big table. And so every, this, at this point, we were feeding, a, we were sharing food with about 100 people every day. And uh, so we were buying food every day. And so we're walking to the store to get bread. And we uh, are on the way to the store. And my, my friend and I are walking on the avenue. It's kind of like our red light district. And uh, one of the women propositions me and I had not had that happen a lot, so I just felt really, really awkward. And we kind of went on to the store. We got our bread. We came back to the house. And then we were unloading the bags. And we noticed that one of the bags of bread had gotten, it had a tear in the side. So it was all crusty and stale. And my friend goes, that's all right. I got the receipt. We'll run back. I'm like, awesome. We get to go back that same way, you know. And so we walk back again. And we exchange a loaf of bread, no problem. But on the way home, we see that woman. And this time, she's just freezing. She's shivering in the cold. And she's hunkered down an alleyway. 
And we walk in, we know that we can't just pass her by. We, we walk up to her and we say, listen, um, uh, if you need a place to get warm, if you need a safe place to, to just be, you can come back. We've got a little community around the corner. And she jumps up, falls us back to the house. She comes inside and she just loses it. As she walks in the door of our house, she just starts weeping, just wailing, crying. And my friend's rocking her in her arms. And the woman looks up and she says the strangest thing. She goes, you guys are Christians, aren't you? We're like, whoa, you know, I didn't, we don't have a sign that says repent or burn or anything like that. You know, and so we're like, how'd you know? And she said, I know that you're Christians because I can, I can see it. I can feel it. And she said, I used to be so in love with Jesus too. And she said, I used to have that fire in my soul, that love of God. She said, I used to shine like the stars in the sky. And then she said, but it's a cold, dark world. And it feels like it's just killing the good in me. We prayed for her. And we didn't know if we'd see her again. She left. And uh, a few weeks later, there was a knock at the door. We get a lot of knocks at the door. So I just kind of fling it open. And this woman, it's about midnight. She jumps in the house. And she goes, hey! And I'm like, whoa, do we know each other? Let's start there. You know, and, uh, and she says, yeah, you just don't recognize me because I'm on fire again. And she said, I'm a new woman. And, and then I knew who she was when she started talking, you know, and she said, she said, I wanted to just say thank you. And then she almost apologetically said, but I lost everything on the streets. And so um, I did have one thing that I wanted to give you all because I smoked a lot of cigarettes and she said, I always collected the Marlboro Miles from the cigarette boxes. So hold on a minute. And she goes out and she pulls this shoe box full of Marlboro Miles. And uh, th- these were little, you know, coupons that turns out make really good page markers for your Bible. But I, you know, she gave me this hundreds of them. And I'm imagining my mom when I come home with a Marlboro baseball cap. What's up, mom? And, uh, but that every time I open my Bible and I see my Marlboro coupon, I'm reminded that we have a God that's loving people back to life. And that's what we get to be a part of. And all of us, if we're honest, there are days that we can feel this world crushing down on us. And we need to be reminded that we are beloved, that we are beautiful. And that's, I'm convinced, uh, a big part of what it means to be long to the church, right? To say that, that every time we come together, we're saying, I need you. You need me. We need each other to survive, right? There's a song like that. Or we're saying, in your t- we're saying, I belong, you belong, we belong together, right? That, that there's this sense that, that we need one another. That's why I love these congregations that are getting creative these days like y'all are. I went to this church the other day. I'm preaching. And I'm coming in on Sunday morning and outside instead of like suits and ties, the greeters at the door of the church have shirts on that say, no perfect people allowed. <laughs> like, yeah, this is my kind of place, right? That's, I mean, that's kind of the invitation in. You're welcome in as long as you know you don't have all your stuff together. Come on in, right? Uh, my friend Tony Campolo, he says, uh, when people tell me that the church is full of hypocrites, I say, no, it's not. We've always got room for more. So what we're doing is we are admitting that we're imperfect people who are falling in love with a perfect God and trying to become more and more like that God. We're trying to help one another love better, love more courageously, and live more like Jesus, right? So we're doing it together. It's also why I like Rich Mullins. You know, I don't know if you know, do you know that name, Rich Mullins? He was a singer and songwriter. He was also known to be very honest about his hypocrisies and struggles. I got to know him a little bit before he passed away. And uh, uh, he, <laughs> there's a story of he and a friend, they're on a, on a train, and they're having this kind of bro down. You know, they're sharing some of their struggles together. And uh, it was a long train ride. And so as they arrive at the station, the woman in front of them recognizes Rich, and she looks back and she goes, pardon me but are you Rich Mullins? <laughs> Rich said, he goes, I started to rehash all of the things that she might have heard me confess to my friend, and I had to decide, was I Rich Mullins? <laughs> and he said, I looked her in the eye, and I said, yes, I am, because he was big enough to own his struggles, right? And that's what I've learned, you know, living in community is that 
we catch each other. You know, we, we, we make space for confession to say that we're, we, we, we've fallen short of who we want to be, but we also remind each other that we are beloved, that we are beautiful, that, that we can do it together. As the great, you know, Henry Nowen, a Canadian, well, he was here in Toronto, right? Can, he, said, he said this, he said, across all barriers of land and language, wealth and poverty, knowledge and ignorance, we are one. And with this compassion, we can say, in the face of the oppressed, I recognize my own face. And in the hands of the oppressor, I recognize my own hands. Their flesh is my flesh. Their blood is my blood. We are all made from the same dirt. And we are all carriers of the divine image of God. That's who we are together. So it's that kind of courage that we need as we think about what it means to be church. As we forge these friendships, you never know where they're going to go. Like I'm listening to these guys up here, you know, and, and I, I, I was uh, in the UK and I had to, I, I was a part of this beautiful community that had a lot of the same vibe here, you know, and I was asking them, how'd you guys get started? And they said, actually, we, um, we started, this guy was telling me he and his wife were sort of a typical suburban family. They didn't have any kids and they were sort of a little bit lonely. And they said, and one day we're walking through town and we met this woman who was six months pregnant and homeless. And we said, you know, you can't be on the streets. And so come back. And they said they thought it would be temporary, you know, that they'd find a shelter or something for her, but they just hit it off and they kept living together. And this, you know, young mother, as she became more and more close to the pregnancy, lived with them. And they said, this is one of our dreams. We prayed to have a child and we just haven't had one. So now we get to have a baby in our house. And then they told her, they said, what's one of your dreams? And she said, well, I've had a lot of people take care of me. And so I, I want to become a nurse so I can take care of other people. So they said, listen here. As she had her baby, they said, we'll take care of your child while you go to nursing school. You can become a nurse. She did, right? And they continued to live together for over 10 years, right? I went back and visited them. And now this woman who had, you know, been on the street, she, she had been out of a really tough situation, six months pregnant on the street. She was now a nurse. And the wild twist of this story is that the woman in that married couple that welcomed her became really, really sick with multiple sclerosis. That's what my dad died of. So I, I was really, I kind of really resonated with them and I kept in touch with them. And she began to die of MS. And she had a nurse that took care of her as she died. Literally this woman that she had, had taken care of in a tough situation was the one who was holding her hand as she died and she did a few years ago. I mean, that looks like Jesus, right? That's a family that is not defined by biology, but by the spirit of the living God, right? That's what I'm convinced it means to be born again, is to, to see beyond biology. To see, that's why nationalism is so myopic, so narrow-sighted, is that, yeah, love for our own people's great, but we love bigger than nation. We love bigger than biology. That's what it means to be born again, right? Mother Teresa said sometimes our biggest problem is that the circle we've drawn around our family is just too small. Whew, just too small. So that's what, what y'all are doing here, right? You, at Southridge, you're, you're expanding what it means to be family beyond biology, beyond nationality. It, it also reminds me of our, you know, as we think about walls versus tables, I was uh, reminded of one of the powerful services I had along our border between the U.S. and Mexico. You might remember we had someone who was really infatuated with building a wall on the border, right? But there was all kinds of resistance of people saying, no, we want to welcome refugees. We want to welcome immigrants. The scripture says when we entertain foreigners, when, when we welcome foreigners, we might be entertaining angels. Jesus said, wouldn't you welcome the stranger? You welcome me. So this community had a worship service along the border where they had folks in Mexico that met on the border wall and they had folks on the U.S. side that gathered on the U.S. side of the border and they sang each other worship songs in Spanish and English and then they said in one week it got really rowdy and we wanted to serve communion so we had to throw the bread up over the wall and we served each other communion because we want to love as big as God loves and God loves beyond 
beyond uh, the walls and borders and picket fences and gated communities. God is calling us to love big. And so that's what we're doing tonight, right? Is not thinking in terms of bigger walls and with the things that we can hide behind, but to extend the table, to, to always make room for someone who might enrich in this community because they bring all of who they are to the table. And so this is holy work. And in the end, you know, I mean, going back to Jesus, in the end, like, we're all going to be gathered before God. And according to Matthew 25, when we give testimony of our lives before God, we're going to be asked a few questions, and they're not just doctrinal questions. You know, we might wish it was a doctrinal test that God would say, okay, virgin birth, agree, disagree, or strongly disagree. I mean, we, we rock that thing, you know, but it's not going to be a doctrinal test. According to Jesus, God's going to say to us, when I was in prison, did you come visit me? When I, when I was hungry, did you give me something to eat? When I, when I was sick, did you take care of me? The, the real sign of our faith is how it works itself out in love and compassion to the most marginalized people. And it's about relationship. Every one of those in Matthew 25 is about a relationship with one another, especially those who have been so pushed aside that it's easy to forget their names. I always like to say, our works don't earn our salvation, they demonstrate it, right? They, they, are, they show that we are a part of this radical community of Christ. And it's been said, if you want to know who the Christians are, you ask the folks on death row. You ask the folks who are sleeping in the alleyway. You ask the folks who are struggling to make it in their life, who are the people who loved you? Who are the people who showed up? That's the followers of Jesus. So may it be so of us. If we really care about those who are hurting, those who Jesus called the least of these, we know each other's name. And this whole story is about a building a new family where we know each other's name. Thank you so much for inviting me into your family. Let me pray for us. I think we're going to talk for a minute with Nate. Thank you, Lord, for all that you're doing in this space. It's an honor to be here and to stand in awe of your love at work in real friendships. So make us subversive friends that love across the barriers of sameness. Help us to be people who love courageously, fearlessly, like you do. In Christ's name, amen. Thanks so much. Yeah, man.